from Silicon Valley, the heart of startup land. It's Getting to Alpha, the show about creating innovative, compelling experiences that people love. And now, here's your host, game designer, entrepreneur, and startup coach, Amy Jo Kim. Matt Leacock is a board game designer who specializes in cooperative games. His first big hit, Pandemic, is a co-op game where you team up to save the world from virulent diseases. In his latest game, Pandemic Legacy, Matt extends the core gameplay with an overarching narrative structure that delivers an episodic experience where every choice can have great impact. Matt's background as a UX designer shines through in his approach to iterative prototyping and finding the fun in his core games. It is important also to show prototypes to playtesters that are an appropriate level of fidelity. If you show them a really polished prototype, you're not going to be getting feedback that's really high level because people are going to make the assumption that the game's almost done and that any kind of radical ideas will probably be censored or just not even brought up because uh, people find them inappropriate for the level of the prototype that you're showing with them. I love cooperative games, and Matt Leacock is one of my game design heroes. It's such a thrill to talk with him about his creative process and to share it with you. Listen in and learn how a world-class board game designer brings his ideas to life. Welcome, Matt, to the Getting to Alpha podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Those who don't know you, I think would be really interested to hear a whirlwind tour of your background. So how did you first get started in design and tech and gaming? And what were pivotal moments along the way that led you to what you're doing now? Well, I first started out as a graphic designer, uh, studied visual communication and worked as a professional graphic designer in Chicago for a number of years. And then kind of got the call, a former classmate of mine had gotten a job at Claris and wanted me to come out for an interview. So I, I jumped at the chance and landed a job at Claris and did visual interaction design. So I did a lot of icons and splash screens and that sort of thing uh, for all of four months before uh, getting laid off. So made the, the trek from the Midwest out there and then immediately got laid off. So I started my Silicon Valley journey um, on the right foot, I <laughs> think, set the tone. But uh, that's where I, I met a lot of great people. I, I ended up getting a job at Netscape where I moved into interaction design. They had a really great community there. Uh, Netscape morphed into AOL and then on to, to Yahoo and met a, met a great community of designers where I started to kind of understand what interaction design was and what user experience design was. So that's, that's sort of my journey out as a user experience designer. But all along, I was doing board game design. Uh, board games have been a passion of mine since I was a little kid. And so I always wanted to get one published. Uh, even when I was a, a teenager, I sent out um, uh, prototypes to try to get some attention. And as I became a graphic designer, I, I, you know, the, the prototypes started looking better and better. But they, they, I don't think the games were, were very good. I think I made, uh, I don't know, maybe dozens of games, really low quality games. But I, I think I think you need to, <laughs> you need to make a lot of bad games before you can make a good one. I think. But that was sort of a, a side job for me. So you had these two threads going in parallel. You had your evolution from graphic design and visual design into interaction design. And then you had a similar evolution from board game lover and wannabe designer into designer with a few games under your belt and the ability to actually recognize that you had built a crappy game. <laughs> it's a great story because so many people that haven't designed a game don't realize how hard it is and don't realize that, in fact, yes, you do need to build crappy games on the way to building good games. Yeah, I think it's like being a writer. I mean, it's it's not that difficult to write something. You can write, you can just grab a pencil and paper and start writing. You, you can make a game very quickly, and it's very accessible to lots of lots of people. You know, the barrier for entry is very low, but to get a higher quality uh, product requires picking up some some techniques and, and playing a lot of games and, and really kind of learning about what the hobby's all about and, and human behavior. There's so many things you can you can bring into game design. Reminds me of playing bass. I'm a bass player and I changed from being a guitar player. And at first it seemed pretty easy, four strings. And it's really easy to be a crappy bass player. Being a good <laughs> bass player, very sophisticated. I'm on the journey, but I'm not there. And it's, again, that thing where it's not that hard to get going, but then there's so much to learn and so much to develop. 
So those two threads are fascinating. And there's a third thread, Matt, which is how did you get interested in co-op design in particular? I like to play games with my family and friends quite a bit. And I play a lot of games with my wife. And we had played, I think, a negotiation game. I think the game was called Chinatown. And it got really nasty. And we both finished the game and felt horrible and wondered why we had done that. And um, I, I bring that up because I contrast it with an experience that I had playing a, a different game, a cooperative game called uh, Lord of the Rings by Reiner Knizia, where we played that together and we had a common foe and it was an engaging experience. And even if we lost the game, we both felt really, really good. So I had this really great experience with a cooperative game and I thought the design was really novel and interesting. And, and I wanted to see if I could do something kind of like it. So that was the underpinnings of a pandemic, trying to design a game that I would really enjoy playing with my wife. And I think that led right into, you know, additional cooperative games after it. So do you see that dovetailing with your experiences as a UX designer? Yeah, I think it's really difficult for me to separate user experience from game design. There's so many overlaps. Seriously. I mean, I've been able to use the entire toolkit uh, that I used at work directly in, in game design. And you get to wear a few more hats as well. I mean, there, there are some differences in that. I'm lucky enough to be able to define some of my own products. So I get to kind of put a, a product manager hat on from time to time, at least before I hand the product over to the publisher. And then, you know, they, they help with the reins there. But it's nice being able to do some product definition work in addition to the design. And then the engineering is really great. One of the things I love so much about user experience design was paper prototyping and being able to create a, a design really, really quickly, get in front of people, get feedback immediately, and then iterate on it. Well, when you're doing board game design, um, when you're done, you've got the paper prototype and it's engineered you know, right there for you. I can hand off a completed prototype to a, a publisher and I don't need to get someone to code it up because uh, I'm, I'm not a coder. And so, you know, I basically am tweaking all the variables. So it's, it's as easy as uh, pulling a card out of a card sleeve or, or crossing something out and rewriting it. And then, you know, running the program is just putting it in front of people again. So um, those those things I, I really enjoy. The fact that it's, it's very hands-on and uh, I feel like I've got a lot more control over it. That's so cool. So your latest game, Pandemic Legacy, is a different spin on co-op design. Yeah, so um, that game has been really, really fun and challenging to work on. It's been fun to see how it's been received. It basically takes the pandemic game and adds a legacy component to it. Uh, that was a, a system or a, I guess a, a style of gaming that Rob Davio pioneered when he was at Hasbro in a game called Risk Legacy. And it essentially means that the, the game is going to change as you play it. So as the players play the game, they're modifying the actual physical components of it uh, in the same way you might with a craft project. You're adding stickers to it or you're scratching certain things off like a lottery ticket or even ripping up components. And the whole game is more like an experience. It's a one-way journey through a, kind of like an epic storyline. And so when you're done, you've, you've, you've played, uh, you know, typically about 16 to 18 different games. And the end result is this, this world that you and your fellow players have shaped that'll be different than any other people's sets. So everybody has, um, goes through a similar story, but the, the results of their actions show up in their game in very different ways. And they, everybody has different short stories to, to share when, when they're done with the game. How is co-op woven into that? Well, it's a cooperative game just like Pandemic is. So uh, one of the nice things about the game is you can pull it out of the box. And if you know Pandemic, you can start playing it right away because it, it starts out like Pandemic, but then it gradually morphs. So um, it's very similar in, in, this, in the cooperative nature to the, the game it's based on, uh, that, that players are basically doing group problem solving. Uh, you might think of it as like distributed computing. There's a very complex a logistical puzzle laid out in front of them. How are they going to tackle uh, keeping all the world's diseases in check while they, they look for cures? Uh, but the, the added layer that the Pandemic Legacy set has is that the enemy is always morphing. The diseases and the situation uh, of the world is always being modified. So as you play the game, you move from month to month. You start the game in January. It's a, sort of like a January game. And if you win that, you move on to a February game and so on. And each, each month, the setting of the game and some of the variables and, and uh, again, based on the actions that the players have done, have modified the set as well. And so you've got kind of a dynamic system that all the players need to um, immerse themselves in and internalize and, and communicate about and, and then try to figure out what the best strategy is uh, going forward. So it's fascinating because 
You know, there's a lot of discussion in game design circles about forever games, you know, games that you can play over and over and over again, like poker or Scrabble or, you know, various other games. And then games that you play through and you're done, which is more like a movie or a book or solving a puzzle. Once you've solved the puzzle, you've solved the puzzle. It's fascinating because Pandemic is a game you could play over and over again. It's a forever game, right? Right, that's right. And then on top of it, you created essentially a metagame that gives the forever game a lifetime, but it gives it a whole other level of engagement and enjoyment. Yeah, I think um, we tried to play with the, the fact that the game is essentially disposable. Uh, and what that means is that there are certain things that you take for granted in a, in a game, like um, the ability to undo an action or the ability to, you know, the next time you play, you can try it slightly differently. But you don't really have that necessarily in this game. So the, the consequences of your actions have much more gravity. You, you think twice about certain decisions because they'll have implications not only for the current session you're in, but all the future sessions as well. If if, if a city gets degraded or starts to riot or even fall, uh, these are things that can happen to the to the world. You're going to have to deal with that for you know the next the rest of the the, the campaign, and so it it just adds a it, even more emotional impact, I think, to to all the different decisions that the players need to make together. Yeah, and it's really paralleling the rise of episodic long-form television. Yeah, actually, we kind of stumbled into that. We, we noticed that we had these breaks in between games where you have these little rituals where you, 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 know, you set the game up, you play the game, you tear it down, you make certain decisions. And it almost felt like the opening and closing of a TV episode. And we looked at the connective tissue between games and it felt like, you know, how you might write the end of a, a chapter in order to get um, someone to, to keep turning the pages in, in, in a good page turner. And also the ability to, to layer in uh, a larger story arc and uh, we started to look at uh, the way different screenplays were constructed and, and how act breaks uh, worked and uh, really tried to layer in a lot of that, those storytelling, storytelling elements that were really new to me. You know, I had to do a little bit of, of reading and research on there. And I feel like there's, there's a lot more to learn, but it was fun to be able to take advantage of that in, in, this, in this structure and in, in the way that we set up the system. What? are one or two of the things you learned about good story structure from this recent experience? Well, I mean, I know you don't want to have, I talk about this a lot, you, you really want people's emotions to, to go up and down. You don't want a, a flat line. And so there's certain things you can do to get people excited or afraid and just kind of modulate that emotion throughout the course of, of play. Also, you know, building up to a certain crescendo and then having some sort of resolution but with greater stakes as the, as the game progresses up to a, you know, a climax near the end with some sort of resolution or denouement period at the end. Uh, so we, we tried to incorporate a lot of those, those sorts of things, both the, the scene to scene sort of tension uh, and release to the, the higher level uh, structure of, of, you know, how an act might play out. How you have some sort of like the first act is all about this and then there's some sort of resolution and then, then there's some more complex thing layered in the second act and so on. While you were doing that, were you also thinking about co-op versus zero-sum game design? Yeah, I don't think about it so much in those terms. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, when I'm doing a co-op game, I'm generally thinking about myself designing a uh, antagonist or um, I guess it, it's, it's like doing a, a puzzle where the players all work together to try to unwind it. But it's more complex than that uh, because you want the, each player to have some sort of sense of agency and independence. And there's lots of different ways you can do that so that no single player dominates. But really, for me, it's it's more like I'm just trying to come up with a problem to solve. Yeah, a cardboard a cardboard opponent, basically, that the players that that's worthy of the opponents that that's going to engage them and they're, they're going to find challenging and worthwhile to butt their heads against. Well, that's actually one of the deepest things about co-op gaming that's different from competitive gaming is that you're competing against the system, AKA an antagonist or like a zombie or a zombie horde or a contagions that are gonna wipe out the world or aliens or, you know, but they're all embodied systems. Yeah, it's more like you playing a computer opponent as opposed to the computer just providing the context for play or, or the rules of engagement between two different opponents. And you, you said group problem solving earlier, and I think that's a great phrase to capture how you're thinking about this. It's like not personal problem solving, group problem solving. How can we solve this together? That's right. In fact, they, they use pandemic specifically, and uh, I just heard from a researcher who's using it in um, Leicester and, and the UK, 
for people studying to be in the medical profession. And basically they set up like 80 people at one go, all sitting down at, at tables playing pandemic with facilitators actually watching how they, <laughs> how they collaborate and solve their problems together as, as teams of, of professionals, you know, in training. And then they have a debrief and they, they look and see how they're all interacting. And then they play again and see, you know, it, have they made any improvements or what has changed? So it's, it's interesting in that uh, they're using it there for, for studying how groups are solving problems. That's fantastic. Wow. Oh, I would love to uh, share a link to that if it's uh, a publicly available thing on the web. Yeah, I, I don't know that he's got a shingle out yet on the web for it, but it, it, I was really excited to see that they were, they were doing that. And they had some um, working at the methodology of it and found that it was actually something that the groups found compelling and actually useful. To get a little bit game nerdy for a moment, can you talk about how you think about resources and managing resources and sharing various kinds of resources as a cooperative game designer? Is that something that you consider when you're going after a co-op game design within a game? Well, one thing that you can do in a, in a cooperative game is to uh, make it so that uh, different players have different amounts of information, and that, and that can lead to a certain kind of uh, feeling of autonomy where I know something that you don't and therefore we need to communicate more because I'm not in charge of all the resources on the board and you're not in charge of all the resources on the board and so therefore we need to to, to cooperate in order to get get the job done um, a lot of a lot of my games uh, it's more around uh, specialization and abilities more than resources or, or information mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah that can be a technique uh, just giving certain people access this certain stuff and other people access to other stuff. It's not something I really probe very deeply in though. Dan Cook calls that asymmetric information. Sure. Yeah. And Hanabi is a really good example of a, a card game that does it quite well. So talk more about your approach to uh, differentiating skills and roles. I try to present players with a really challenging problem that they wouldn't be able to do if they were like every man or every every people, right? Um, if they're all generic uh, actors. So I give everybody some sort of superpower in a lot of my games. So we're talking about like Pandemic or Forbidden Island or Forbidden Desert, where, you know, everybody has sort of like this core set of things they can do, but certain players are, are really excel at very specific things. And then when it comes time to solve a problem, players often have to try to figure out how to play to their strengths. And, um, you know, if they don't, then the problem is too difficult. So they, they are forced to kind of figure out how to take advantage of everybody's um, ability. And then everybody gets a, a chance to shine. They get to feel special because they can, they can move in a certain way uh, that's much more effective than someone else. Or they're, they're really powerful, at, for example, at like removing or curing diseases um, in, in pandemic, for example. Wow. So do these superpowers allow them to do things synergistically? Yeah, I mean, that's actually... Uh, one thing I was really trying to design into uh, one of my more recent games, Forbidden Desert, that's a really challenging game. And the only way you can really play it and win on the harder levels are trying to figure out all the sort of exploits in the game where you can have one player who can move another player who can then pick up another player who can allow the, both of those players to like move through large piles of sand, for example. Uh, in, in certain games, they might feel like cheats or exploits, but at the, the higher levels of that game, you need to like figure out all the different ways you could possibly do different super combos between the different roles. So do you ever work with or get questions from younger game designers, you know, people that you're coaching or, you know, training or who look up to you, asking you advice for how to like start off in game design? Yeah, I, I, do, I do get questions from time to time about how to get started. And I think, you know, the simplest thing I, I'd say is to just start, start making stuff, you know, don't worry about how good it is. So given that, what are the most common mistakes that you see first time game designers and game creators make in the early stages when they're bringing their idea to life? And what's your best advice for how to supercharge your way through those really common mistakes? A few come to mind um, right away. I mean, one is, uh, I don't see this quite as much these days, but uh, often people would be very protective of their ideas. You know, they'd want uh, an NDA or they, they wouldn't want to share their their project with people for fear that they would get, the idea would be, be stolen or someone would, you know, take it and run with it. And I tell those people that they shouldn't worry about it, that the ideas are, are more or less a dime a dozen and that the execution is really what sets the stuff apart. 
I also tell people to really try to show their project or their their game to as many people as they can and, and a really diverse set of people to get a diverse um, input. Often you get a new designer with a, with their game that they're really passionate about that they've played with their close group of friends and they've played it repeatedly and they've been tuning it with a very small group of folks and you end up with this sort of like insular <laughs> design that has very narrow appeal. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the, the advice I have for those folks is just to share your your stuff with as many people as you can in order to get additional feedback. That's awesome. Give us a little glimpse into how you approach discovery and play testing and bringing your ideas to life on like a recent project, the like Forbidden Desert or on the Legacy Game. I know you talked about the Legacy Game in a video that we're going to include along with this episode. What is that process like for you? Where does playtesting come in? How do you sort of figure out which are the good ideas and which aren't? <laughs> yeah. Um, the early phases are a little bit magical to me um, in the sense that they're a little harder to pin down. The process that I've refined over time, especially as a user experience designer, when you've got a, a working system, a working core engine, and you know, developing that into a playable, accessible, polished game are, are much uh, more well-known to me. Uh, the early stages are a little harder when it comes to like ideation, when you're extending a, a, an existing product, it's a lot easier. You know, I, I did a, a dice version of Pandemic called Pandemic the Cure. And that was really a, an exercise in kind of reducing the game into its essence and trying to figure out how to replace certain elements in the board game with, with dice and how to eliminate the board and abstract it. Um, those are a little more straightforward. When you're, you, when you're staring at a blank sheet of paper and want to come up with a brand new game, it's, it's more difficult. You need to find that, that core hook or the core mechanism or the core conceit that, that you want to chase. And most of the time, that just kind of comes down to just goofing off. Um, <laughs> a lot of, sometimes it'll be a, a, an itch, uh, like I really want to try to explore this or that. But I'll start with a sketchbook and I'll sketch out some ideas. But before long, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about like less than an hour, I'll need to make something to interact with to see. It, 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 sketches are, are great. They're, they're like a nice way to have a conversation with yourself to kind of reflect back on what, what's on your head and, and um, almost like a, a conversation with yourself. But the prototypes are, are more alive. They give you much richer feedback. And so I, I start prototyping almost immediately. In what form? Uh, just really just scraps of paper. Um, uh, the pandemic prototype was just some scrawls on a, a piece of um, just a really big oversized piece of newsprint with a, a Sharpie and a, a regular set of playing cards. You want to explore the space really, really quickly and you, you don't want to get hung up on the, the tools necessarily. And uh, I really like to have this stuff be as disposable as, as possible uh, when, I'm, when I'm working early. Later on, when I've got to do a lot of um, iterations and I don't want to keep redrawing the same thing over and over again, I'll move into into software and, and use Adobe Illustrator or something similar so that I can uh, iterate more effectively because I can build on my, my previous iterations. But early on, I, I like something uh, really disposable and cheap. Awesome. That's great advice. Well, then you're not invested in it and you give yourself permission to iterate. Right. And it's important also to show prototypes to playtesters that are an appropriate level of fidelity. If you show them a really polished prototype, you're not going to be getting feedback that's really high level because people are going to make the assumption that the game's almost done and that any kind of radical ideas will probably be censored or just not even brought up because uh, people find them inappropriate for the level of the prototype that you're showing with them. Thank you for saying that. I see that all the time. And there's this meme going around, especially in the Valley, that you know, if you're doing a one-week design sprint, the thing you show people at the end is a really polished visual prototype. And that it's an important part of prototyping. And occasionally, I understand why you might want to do that because it quote unquote looks real. But just like you, I found that you get such different feedback if it looks rough. Right. Yeah. And um, just it doesn't really tell the, the story either. I mean, what, what you said sparked an idea of when I did a lot, when I was a design manager and, and did interviews of people, I would get polished you know, final products coming in the door and people would be trying to explain to me how, how great they were. But what I really wanted to see was the story of the development, all the rough and uh, tumble kind of iterations that the designers did along the way uh, really help expose the thinking behind it. And so if you've got really experienced play testers, uh, if you're fortunate enough to have people who are also game designers, you can share, you know, those, those rough iterations and get rich feedback. But I, I think it really, it really comes down to who you're sharing the the work with and at what level uh, you're at. I mean, early on, uh, 
the, the prototypes that I've developed, I'm the only one who can really understand what's going on because they're so rough. They're napkin sketches and they're, they're using components that don't really map very well and, and so on. But as I gradually refine the, the prototypes, it opens up the audience to uh, a wider set of people who, are, who can actually understand what's going on. And so as, as the circle widens out and I'll, I go from myself to friends and family to colleagues to friends of friends to pe- random people I meet at conventions to, to complete strangers, the, the fidelity typically gets, gets finer and finer. Exactly. And those concentric rings of playtesters, I think, is very much a part of how really good games come to life. You know, you don't just go test with random people right away. You've got this kind of early adopter ring around you that's part of getting there. And you show them earlier stuff. So one of the arguments people come up with was, well, I want to test on my, you know, target audience and I have to show them something polished. Well, find people who you don't have to show something polished to, right? And those people give you that great early feedback. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and there's stuff that's common to all games. If you want to test that core engine, you can do it with people that aren't necessarily in the target just to see uh, if you're in the ballpark and then, you know, refine as you, get, as you go out wider and wider. So for you, as a co-op game designer, what's most challenging about co-op? You know, I know that most people, when they think of games, they think of competitive games. And in many ways, it's much more straightforward to design a competitive game. You know, I, so I design both cooperative games and competitive games. Oh, cool. Okay, good. I just happened to stumble into a cooperative and had a good, had a good uh, run so far. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've done uh, competitive games as well. And I don't find either one of them necessarily a whole lot easier. It's, it's somewhat easier for me to do cooperative games in that. It's easier for me to play test early uh, versions of them by myself because I have an easier time working against the, you know, quote, cardboard enemy by playing multiple roles in succession, because they all sort of have the same point of view. They're all trying to defeat that that common enemy. Where if you're playing and testing a competitive game by yourself, I have a harder time kind of like switching roles where imagine yourself playing chess with yourself. You know, you sit down on one side and then rotate the chess board or get up and sit in the other seat. And you have to kind of rebuild your strategy from, from scratch at the end of every turn <laughs> on a turn-based game. So I find the co-op games a little bit easier to, to play test. The challenging thing for me, though, is trying to come up with a really novel cardboard uh, antagonist that's that's worthy of the players uh, with a, a set of rules that's, uh, you know, not too long and, and pretty approachable and exciting. You know, ensuring that each game is, is novel and, and, you know, not not repeating the same thing over and over again is, is, is a bit of a trick when you're trying to come up with something nasty and challenging and, and exciting to play against. So looking back at all the things you've built and designed as a UX designer, as a co-op designer, as a competitive game designer. What do you feel is your superpower as a creator? What's your sweet spot? Well, I do a lot of remote testing over video. And I think that format works pretty well for co-op games because as people are playing a cooperative game, they're sort of doing a think aloud process because they need to share what they're thinking with their fellow players in order to form an effective strategy. So I'll ask people to, to play test a game and set up a, a just a like a mobile phone with a uh, recording feature on it and record themselves as they play. And then they'll post the, the video files up online and uh, we'll watch them. So it, for example, for Pandemic Legacy, Rob and I watched you know hundreds of hours of, <laughs> of video. And what I, I think I'm fairly good at is, is being able to pick up on emotional cues between the players, whether they're engaged when they're bored, when they're, when they're interested, when they're uh, put off by a certain story element, all the different kinds of uh, emotional ups and downs. Are they disinterested? Are they confused? That sort of thing. So that's my favorite method for really gathering data is just direct observation. And when you do video, you can go back and, and watch something several times. I mean, there's certain turns of story in Pandemic Legacy specifically that we we modified the, the story text because the, they were, the notes were falling flat and we were able to iterate on that. You know, it, it was interesting watching uh, the same group hit those story breaks over different iterations of the game and comparing them with, with other groups and just seeing, you know, what, what's resonating and what's not. And I, I think that's really difficult if, to pick up on if you're, if you're just sending out a prototype and asking someone to fill out a survey, you know, what, what did you like the most? So I, I think my superpower there is really just trying to, both, both in the methodology of, of just doing all this direct, direct observation and then 
trying to pick up on all those subtle cues and, and using that as fodder for the next generation. Sounds like you turned yourself into a storyteller through uh, player testing. I guess so. <laughs> in, a, in a way, um, which is just a great melding of all your uh, various skills and threads. So a couple more questions. What do you see that's interesting and new and stimulating to you these days? What trends or people are you following and who's inspiring to you? There's a lot of, just a lot of innovation happening in board games because there's so many games being made now. You can really look around and, and see all sorts of different things being explored. I, one of the favorite designers I like to, to watch is a, a gentleman named Vlada Shavatel from um, Czech Games Editions, uh, a Czech designer uh, who's come up with just all sorts of different crazy ideas, whether they're real-time cooperative games or sort of like reinventing the party game with uh, his, his uh, recent game called Codenames. He's just out there. A lot of his games are, are really complex and I'll only play them once or twice, but I'm always surprised at how he kind of pushes the envelope. So I, I keep an eye on him. I think people are really trying to figure out how to bring technology into board games, which I think is a little bit uh, like a, a solution in search of a, a problem. Uh, people trying to bring in um, you know, tablets or, or mobile phones into the board game experience, whether it's to, to track information or to provide some sort of sensory experience. I haven't seen anyone really succeed at that. I imagine at some point someone will, will make a, a breakthrough and uh, should really show how those things add value. But for me, uh, board gaming is a social experience. You know, you're really trying to, it's an excuse to sit around a table and connect with people socially. So those really take me out of the experience. But I do see a lot of people really trying to crack into that. That sounds like that part's not inspiring to you. Yeah, it's not. I think a lot of people really want it to work or uh, think it's going to be the next big thing. But I'm not a real believer yet, so we'll, we'll have to see. That's interesting. So what's coming up on the horizon? What are you uh, planning or what topics are you interested in? What's going to be happening that you'd like to let us know about? Well, Pandemic Legacy is subtitled season one, so uh, it should be no surprise that we've got other seasons in the works. Um, nice. <laughs> so that those things are, are fairly large projects, so those, those keep me very busy. So Rob and I meet very frequently uh, working on those. Uh, but I also do smaller projects as well. For example, I did a, a party game called uh, Knitwit last, uh, last spring, just a 15-minute kind of a social gaming experience. You could, you could pull it out after dinner and enjoy over wine or, or what have you, where you're uh, developing, you, basically you, you collaboratively develop a, a Venn diagram using yarn and you put spools in, you build this little sort of like diagram and then have to, to knit it together with, with witty answers. So it's a little word game. So I like to break up the, the larger projects with smaller ones. Okay, where did you get that idea? How did you come up? That is such a cool idea. How, how did that evolve? How did you come up with that? Uh, Knitwit came from uh, the burning desire to use a whiteboard in the game. So I really wanted to figure out a way that the players could draw something while they're playing. And the problem was my daughter kept breaking the game by uh, drawing a big circle around the entire whiteboard. And my other daughter's handwriting is not great. And we, we were just seeing all these problems with whiteboards, including the fact that the whiteboard markers are, are, are always drawing out on us. But th that's where the idea of drawing Venn diagrams came from. We wanted to draw these Venn diagrams on a whiteboard. And uh, I had the idea of associating adjectives to them and then trying to come up with uh, crazy words that would fit the, the regions. So that was the, that was the central, central idea. And then it evolved over time. I uh, met with a publisher and we, we threw out all sorts of different ideas about like, making the Venn diagram out of things like color forms or string or this or that. So I, I ordered all sorts of different kinds of string, yo-yo string, shoelaces, all sorts of things, and found some that worked. Was using magnets in the to identify the regions, and those morphed into spools once, once this whole knitting idea came about. And tried dozens of different names from Venn Tangled to some other names I wouldn't mention. Uh, and, uh, a friend of mine just suggested Knitwit, and when he said that, uh, everything kind of gelled. The, the game became about knitting witty answers together. What a great description of the creative process. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for sharing your stories and your lessons and just your time with us today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Talk to you again soon. 
Thanks for listening to Getting to Alpha with Amy Jo Kim. The shows that help you innovate faster and smarter. Be sure to check out our website, gettingtoalpha.com. That's getting2alpha.com for more great resources and podcast episodes.